Hi there everyone, welcome to my tutorial. Uh, if it wasn't clear from the title, uh, the real idea behind this tutorial is to how to play your kind of first six to nine months. If you played a spring 61 campaign in Grand Tacticians, the Civil War, uh, the spring campaign, which I think is kind of the campaign that the, that the game offers the most promise on, there's the, the most uh, freedom for the player to decide how they want things to develop. Even if you just go to summer of 61, there will be a lot more already established. And so if you're finding it too challenging, one shortcut would be to, to do that. But I think the promise of the game is, is the spring 61. Because the game is developing and growing more challenging, uh, particularly recently with respect to the economy, balancing budgets and debts, uh, a lot of folks are, are experiencing some challenges. And so this video in particular is is going to offer you uh, a viable path. I, I found that it's worked out a number of different times in version 1.0 uh, and in recent versions before that. <clears throat> and I've, I've termed it going small. It's, it's really about going medium or medium multiple sized core. Uh, we'll get into the, the specifics later on, but that's... That's what this is about. So if you're not familiar, the game, as I mentioned, went to version 1.0 a few weeks back, uh, brought in some new players. There's a learning curve, definitely. And there are some concerns about the economy, credit rating, interplay between uh, military buildup and uh, economic viability. And so this video will get at addressing some of the more concrete problems, I hope, addressing some of the more concrete problems in the Spring 61 campaign. I know that a lot of strategy gamers, maybe, maybe this isn't you if, if you are considering yourself one of those, but I, I think a lot tend to play for the kind of late game. Uh, but in this game, as in other strategy games, you need to do certain things in the short term, medium term, to make it to that late game where you'll have a commanding position. So this video is about that short term route that should help you get to that commanding late stage position that I think many are working towards. Uh, I talk, this is one of the videos where I think I actually am talking strategy. And strategy is not a wish list or anything like that, but it's about how you convert the resources available into goals that work toward some larger achievement. The game gives you your kind of final achievement you're working toward. You win by reducing the enemy national morale to below 25, and then you lose if they're able to do that to you. So for you, it's about the interim goals to get them below 25 and keep yourself above it, and uh, your resources are, are somewhat fixed but also variable, and they're more variable the longer the game goes on, the longer the campaign goes on. In my view, the most important thing in campaign right now, regardless of which campaign it is, but uh, it's it's winning on the the battlefield. Uh, right now, there there it doesn't seem to offer a side a viable chance of winning through macro. I'll say uh, macro keeps you in the micro, but it's about winning winning battles on the the battlefield, and that's your most sure way to actually get the enemy national morale below 25. Different video, we'll talk about tactics on uh, how to complement this, this strategy, but this is on the bigger picture stuff, and the tactical uh, video will be its own thing on, on what do you do on the battlefield. Uh, what next? This video is going to start with the kind of most important, earliest, biggest strategic decisions you can make. And then we're going to gradually work down to smaller strategic concerns that don't quite get into the tactical. So, <clears throat> uh, why I'm encouraging all of you to fight with you know, several small to mid-sized core whether they're attached into an army or not is is up to you and i'll talk about that later if you don't know what i'm, I'm already talking about but as i'll show you time and again uh, and this is based on my reading of the manual and following along with how the the game 
works, the incentives that are stated to you, the game incentivizes you to have small to medium-sized forces rather than a few behemoth armies, uh, a kind of doom stack running around the uh, map. So you don't want to fight the incentives that the game offers you. You can certainly do that, and I think some people do that maybe to try to make the game a bit more challenging. That's fine, but this is more geared towards not how to make the game harder, but to how to make it easier. Because I'm encouraging you to have core that are on average smaller than the core that the AI will typically bring, there's the possibility you'll fight outnumbered, but remember that core can reinforce one another. And if you go to Military 2, and I'll talk about policy selection shortly, uh, Military 2 allows you to form armies which allow the core to reinforce one another from longer distances. So it is not necessarily the case that just because each of your core are smaller, core per core, compared to the AI, that you'll necessarily be outnumbered on the battlefield. Again, in all likelihood, you will be at some point, and perhaps significantly, and so the tactical stuff for how you deal with those situations will be another, another video. But at the larger level of how you connect resources and several small armies and not consistently be outnumbered with odds you cannot surmount, uh, remember, reinforcements do, do work and it can uh, plug that otherwise pretty big gap of, of being significantly outnumbered core for core. All right, what I'm going to turn to now is at the strategic level, what you should do. Uh, and I'll start at the, the highest level I can think of, which is at the level of how you begin the campaign and what policies you select. All right, as I mentioned, I'm more familiar, I have more practice with the Spring 61 CSA campaign. Uh, and my guess is if you're here, you're here for advice. Uh, and, and my advice is that the, the three that I'm recommending right now that dovetail with this you know, start small but eventually get big and, and you know have the commanding position, the, the three I can recommend to you most highly at the moment, uh, not the historic policies, but what are you doing? Okay, industrialization is absolutely one that I, I am recommending right now. It is good both in 1861, as you go to, from industrialization one and to industrialization two, uh, you're gonna get access to some of the best small arms and artillery and abundant quantities that you're gonna need. And so that those should be on your priority list whether you choose this or not. Because it enables you to subsidize industry to a greater degree and to unlock the industrialization three and four, which enable even greater subsidies, uh, I can't recommend this enough because those subsidies are going to compound their benefits over time as you're able to build up more and more industry. Hopefully those industries reach economies of scale to keep the materiel that you need to fight the war flowing, but also in large enough quantities that they might make economies of scale and are relatively uh, cheap to produce. So I like industrialization uh, for, for either side. Uh, the CSA, I'll, I'll definitely say. Apostles of Disunion is my, my second recommendation. Again, particularly with an eye to how you get through the first six to nine months, you don't have to take on a ton of offensive action outside of the CSA. In fact, you may not want to take any at all. There are advantages to fighting on home turf and what this does is really encourages the CSA to fight on its home turf because it's going to increase support in all slave states by plus 20. Most slave states are going to be part of the CSA. Some may not be. Uh, but support is so important for so many other things in this game that are also important that plus 20 is, is a, a huge benefit. Uh, it's going to make it harder to... Uh, build up support in Northern Territory, but oh well. Uh, that's a problem that I'll, I think you'll be in a better position to deal with later in the campaign, and it's not really your most pressing problem in 1861 and 1862, which is defending your territory and perhaps opportunistically building out. So Apostles of Disunion, 
anything with state support being strong, it's going to deliver immediate benefits and it's also going to deliver long-term benefits, but also it's going to impose some short and long-term costs if you try to undertake offensive action outside of the slaveholding states. All right, my last one, it's my current recommendation. It's because I read the manual and I'll plug that in the, the description as well. If you are CSA, you will not be able to produce the Springfield rifled musket without selecting arms agents. Why they don't tell that? Well, I guess they, they kind of do tell you that, but you can still get Springfield muskets even without arms agents. The Springfield muskets, in my view, are, are fairly trash, although they are pretty high when it comes to power. Their range is terrible. Their accuracy, well, the range is bad. Their accuracy is bad. The Springfield mu rifle musket gives you 400 yard range, its accuracy is mediocre, uh, which is actually a few levels above what the Springfield musket is. It is plentiful, and if you care about this, uh, it's domestically produced, which is going to give, it's going to keep resources in the CSA at least. It's not going to be an outflow of cash in the form of imports from other countries, and so it may also dovetail with industrialization and that desire to build a kind of defense industry that's capable of, of supporting an army that can defend the, the, the territories. So those are the three that I, I select. Again, there are others, and I'll talk about the others and, and some of the things I got wrong in another video. We don't need to dwell on all of that now. For the North, if you're going to take it from the Sp Spring 61 campaign, I still like industrialization for the same reasons. I don't think secure... I, I don't think security measures is as important because as I understand it, the North gets access to Springfield rifled muskets, I think, without even doing industrialization one. And they don't need security measures to also get it. So I wouldn't think about that one necessarily. Industry, industrialization, as I mentioned, is, is definitely one of them. Uh, <clears throat> Kansas, a free state, is a strong maybe. Uh, it should ensure, actually, it will ensure that you definitely get Kansas. Kansas in itself, I, I can't say is all that important, but it, it might be. Plus five support, though, in all free states seems like a, a, a big deal, too. I'm increasingly thinking that as I've looked and learned about railroads, credit rating, railroad construction speed, and how railroads dovetail with supply, not just transport, but also supply issues. I, I'm starting to more strongly recommend Union Pacific Railroad. I think that that's, that's a, a fair one as well. Again, I'm not as well versed on the, the Union policies, but if I got industrialization, Kansas Free State, and Union Pacific Railroad, I would feel pretty confident that I'd have both short-term and uh, long-term paths to, to, to victory, but I'm, I'm mostly concerned with the long long-term one. So that's a campaign policy selection and how that would dovetail with this go small, kind of build big later. All right, the next kind of highest order thing I would have you think about are how you research your policies at the beginning of the Spring 61 campaign. And what typically happens is that the AI, I believe, gets a, a, a jump in readiness relative to you. Uh, and, and I believe that's true whether you're, you're CSA or, or USA. It doesn't really matter what, what side. Uh, but your challenge is going to be throughout the spring and summer of 61 to get, up, to get up a big enough force that can repel attacks into your territory, but not build it up so quickly that you end up breaking the bank. And so what policies I can recommend you do, and, and maybe their, their order, I would say re research the militia acts at least as far up until you get one-year contracts. Uh, it's a relatively quick research. I think that the same is true for militia act two, that you know the one that gives you two-year contracts. Uh, that 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 seems like a good one. You want your units to build up some experience. Uh, you don't have to go you know crazy. You don't have to go for three-year contracts right away. But that, that that's one of the ones I. I would recommend. Also, right off the bat, I can recommend to you industrialization, or sorry, industry one 
is one of them, and either right before or right after that, Diplomacy won. And if you took my advice as CSA, and it doesn't really matter if you did with USA, if you take in, if you took arms agents, <clears throat> you'll be able to start getting Springfield rifle muskets. Industry will allow you to subsidize more of them. Industry also unlocks uh, a number of okay small arms and artillery. Not always in the greatest quantities, but they're going to unlock some of it. So you can do that one. And again, right before, right after that, you want to do Diplomacy 1, because Diplomacy 1 is going to give you access to both the British Springfield and the Austrian Lorenz rifles, which are pretty plentiful, especially when combined. Uh, and they're qualitatively probably as good or better than the Springfield rifle musket. And they're going to be better than reboard rifles and just regular old Springfield muskets. So Diplomacy 1, you should do. Whether you invest any more in Diplomacy after that, I'm still on the, the, the fence. There might be a, a path there, but I think Diplomacy 1 should be should be one of them. And remember, by researching these policies does not mean I'm telling you to immediately buy and upgrade every unit. I'll get there. But you want to have the opportunity to do so in your, your back pocket. Once you've done the one-year contract, maybe two-year contract, Industry 1, Diplomacy 1, I'd recommend probably hitting Industry 2. I looked through the manual in terms of what guns you get when, and I came to the conclusion that by and large, uh, by the time you do Industry 2, you're going to get most the small arms and artillery that you're really ever going to want and need, particularly in 1861 and 1862, when you may not have the economic wherewithal to buy much more than that. You may not have the troops that are going to require it, require it to be equipped. So <clears throat> Industry 2, I would snag. And after this, it I think there's more flexibility. That should suffice to take you into the summer of 1861. There are some things you're going to want to think about. Uh, I haven't talked about recruitment. I am going to get there, but... The bills are going to start piling up. And so I can see a case made for government funding one. Credit rating is important for reasons I covered in my economic tutorial. Uh, by the way, this is me in 1863, as you can see from the top. This is a campaign I'm, um, I'm in. <clears throat> uh, the, the policies here, I'm a little iffy on. But long term, what I really like for economic stuff is government funding three and the Bank Act. We'll, we'll get there, but you want to save enough policies to potentially be able to go through the, the economic tree here. I also like government funding one because impressment, as I'll talk about a little bit later, seems like a really important act to get past. So funding one, by researching it, it's going to enable you to then have a choice between going for the act or going for government funding two, which is necessary in and of itself. It's good policy. So you might want to think about going that direction. Uh, your armies are going to be start growing in size, even if you follow the advice I give you. I, I think, but I'm not sure that the more that you research of these, the more food you're going to be able to end up growing. And so I would assume all things being equal, the cheaper it will be to supply food, lower food prices should be a significant staple and cost of the army. So you'd want to keep that relatively low. And because... I haven't recommended that you take King Cotton as a starting policy. You're only going to be able to go up to King Cotton 2. So the sooner you get there, if you want to go there, up, <clears throat> the longer you'll have to compound your maxed out subsidies. I'll talk about appropriate subsidies levels in, in just a moment. Uh, but since you can't kick it up to 3 and 4, you're going to have to maybe subsidize agriculture longer to try to make sure you have an adequate food supply. I think if not Agriculture 1 or Funding 1, I think Military 1 is almost certainly a requirement after you've done Industry 1 and 2 and Diplomacy 1. Uh, so again, you have some choice here as to, to what you do. Uh, Military 2 I'm interested in. Uh, in and of itself, it's, it's going to be important and it plays into my go small with your core strategy uh, by allowing you to eventually get armies at Military 2 that can allow somewhat far-flung core to reinforce one another on the battlefield. 
And then, of course, it enables the, the Conscription Act. Uh, I find that this act is almost never worth it. Uh, you're kind of grinding the seed uh, of getting rid of your military experience for some short-term folks who I don't think are coming for free. So you're going to need your, your your troops anyways, and we'll talk about how to, how to build that up on your own. I don't think I ever do the Free Trade Act, but it is something I'm going to experiment with in the future. Civilian warships, I almost never take. Uh, I don't like the idea of the trading fleet and transport capacity of ports being reduced. So that, that, that's my own personal preference. Uh, letters of Mark I took later in this campaign because I was mostly experimenting with economic ones. But I, I, I can't really recommend too many of the acts right here at, at this time. So that would suffice. How do you decide to do military one, agriculture one, and government funding one? I think those three are the ones that come after one-year contracts, maybe two-year contracts, industry one and two, and diplomacy one in whatever order you feel is appropriate. My next recommendation, and here I'm in the finances tab, you can see at the top that that's the one that's, that's highlighted. You look on the right, you have your subsidy slider, which is something you can actually affect. Again, this is a campaign that has gone on a long time. Kind of ignore the squiggles on the screen. It's not that important. But here, I think I've maxed out all my subsidies. My recommendation to you, regardless of which side you're on, go ahead and max out those subsidies early on. Except perhaps trade war. And you may even be able to hold off on civil order until battles start taking place. Uh, Remember, the amounts here are larger in most cases. The max subsidies of $500,000 annually because I've researched different policies. Uh, so I think it'll be two fifty dollars maxed for, for all of yours. Go ahead and do that. What I'm still not sure about is whether you should max out politics at the beginning. I always said no because basically you get five policies for free and then you pay, you can get, up to five more by paying additional subsidies for each one you unlock. But I think I read in the manual that when the politics slider is all the way subsidized, that it increases the research rate. I didn't know that. I haven't been able to verify that, and I'm not sure, but it's a possibility. And if somebody wants to experiment with it, let us know if there's anything to that. That, that would be good to know. Long term, though, definitely pay the subsidies for more policies. They're going to pay themselves off. I covered this in the economic tutorial. But why I recommend maxing out these subsidies, if you look on the left, now again, this is much later, much higher expenses, also probably higher revenue than what you're looking at. Uh, subsidies are a relatively small portion of your budget. I think fully maxed out, they're probably not going to be more than 2% fully maxed out. And they compound their benefits over time. Right? So if you're giving subsidies to industry, you're growing more of the parts of your economy you need for industrialized warfare and that's what the civil war even in this historical fiction is going to require agriculture again food for your armies for your people keep costs low to have more of it why not have those subsidies roll out earlier transportation is important i believe the subsidy rate might affect how quickly railroads are constructed but it does also affect according to the manual now i'm shooting from memory here uh, I believe it affects the capacity to move supplies between points on the map, important infrastructure points and, and other things. Recruitment has a kind of lagged effect. The higher it is, the more folks you're going to be able to recruit. Uh, and recruitment will be important, although I'm going to recommend that you don't go hog wild and recruit as many as you can from the outset. So look... Those are the points. Diplomacy, you max it out because you're going to probably be importing quite a few weapons, even if you have arms agent as CSA in 61. And it seems like the better relations you have, the less you should pay for your imports. And if you're spending a lot on imports, and that could be easy to do, uh, even non-military imports, $250,000 in subsidies to even get you just slightly lower prices, I would think would save you money over the long term. That's as much as I know. That's, that's what I'm thinking. All right, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, I obviously tabbed out here. So on the right-hand side of the screen, there's the armies tab. 
Now, I've created additional armies because the years have gone on, but I believe you get something like six starting armies with the CSA. Maybe it's seven. And I don't remember the number from the Union that you get, but you get a, a fair number. My advice is don't combine those commands. Keep them six or seven for the CSA. And if they're Union, if it's less than that, keep them as they are and be prepared to, to start more. Uh, this is going to be important as I, as I move into uh, how you kind of do the, the, the building small. Or going small, I guess. Now, come on. This is after I've done military too, and I've combined all these are different corps. So Bartos Corps, Cox Corps, Beauregard, and, and so on. But before this, they were all independent corps. Let's see here. All right. So this isn't necessarily a huge big picture thing because you, you can change it. But if you look within each corps, the way I've elected to do it is to have each division. So I think I usually have three divisions per core. I break them up functionally. There are others who want to do it different ways, but functionally to me just, or, or I break it up by branch. So there's an infantry division, there's an artillery division, and there is a cavalry division. As long as you're using relatively small core, I think that that, that is a way that makes sense you could have more divisions, but I don't know that I would necessarily have more brigades overall. So you could have more commands, but not necessarily more brigades. So for example, you may want to break the artillery up into two divisions, even just with four brigades or battalions, sorry, of artillery overall. It, it would seem a bit much for me. I, I don't know why you would, but you could take four infantry brigades and break them up into two divisions of two. I think that this is about the right, the right mix for what I'm gonna propose that you, you do. I would say, kind of as I've done here, I, I generally don't want more than four brigades under a division. But again, that that's my preference, and I'm talking about 61 into 62 when things are a little bit earlier. Uh. You know, there are exceptions for this when it, when it comes to, to horse artillery. Uh, and the more stationary a branch is, I think the more brigades you can have within it. You know, whether you have four or six infantry brigades, most of the time they're going to be pretty much in the same area. And so one commander should be able to give relatively quick orders and inspire the men who should be in close proximity to, to one another. Where you have highly mobile forces... It might make sense to have definitely f no more than four and maybe even fewer than four brigades or battalions attached to each division commander. The reason why the number of brigades and battalions per division might matter has to do with order delays as well as the morale bonus of having division commanders nearby. In general, you want your commanders to, to your division commanders to be the links between the core commander and then each of the brigades or the, the, the battalions. And so you gotta get their spacing right. You don't wanna have super large gaps between the division commander and each of the brigades or battalions because frequently they're gonna need to move quickly, particularly in the mobile ones, particularly for some of the tactics I'll talk about in a, in a future video. Uh, but you want those order delays minimized, and things can get hairy, especially since there's a good chance that even if you do your best, you're going to be outnumbered, perhaps significantly, in some of these early battles. You're going to want to make sure that your, your men move quickly. They're going to have to for both the tactics I'll talk about. And you want to make sure that their morale is as high as can be, especially since early on, morale is kind of hard to come by, as both sides have relatively green troops they haven't seen a lot of combat they don't have a lot of training their commanders may not be particularly able uh, you want to have those commanders in in close proximity all right so specifics on recruitment what i'm going to recommend so you bring up your your order of battle here 
And whenever you go to recruit a new unit, right, it's going to give you an option. Again, right, this is almost two years into it, so my numbers are probably crazy higher than yours. When it comes to infantry, go minimum size. If it's offering you 3,000, 1,500 is your min size. Notice that it changes the recruitment cost to 269 from 537 for the full. Cav, go minimum size, which is 1250. Again, lower recruitment cost. I would not recommend taking normal artillery battalions of any size. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem worth it. And <clears throat> what I'll recommend is that you take horse artillery and you take it at its max size. And it, it seems to me kind of, you know, maybe not obvious, but foolish not to do so. It's only 13,000, right? Compared to the, the minimum size calf, right? 1250 is 260. Thousand and fifteen hundred is almost two hundred fifty thousand, and again, those are min size. Max size already, horse already at one hundred four men is eleven thousand. And if you look even at the min size, there it is, artillery. It's fifteen k for one hundred twenty. It's pretty much the same price as the max size horse artillery. But in theory, the horse artillery is going to be faster. It's going to be more important for some of the tactical stuff I'll talk about. Uh, at another point. So I'd recommend doing that. And again, the reason is because I don't want you to fight the incentives of the game, at least as I understand them. If you were rapidly you know, recruiting, I don't know, a dozen brigades and a half dozen or maybe a dozen battalions of artillery and you did them at their max size, uh, you're going to put a, a massive demand, not just for recruits, which you might have, you might not have, uh, but you're also going to be demanding all the stuff that goes along with the creation of an army. So you're going to have to purchase the small arms, the ammunition, the artillery, its ammunition, horses. You're going to have to provide food, forage, provisions, uniforms for all of them. And when you do all of that to an economy that is not yet ready for the kind of shocks and demands of a war economy, you're going to cause a skyrocket in, in, in your prices. And so what I'm recommending is with the things that usually require more troops, you recruit the smallest number initially. What happens over time is that as new volunteers or draftees later on become available from the states in which that brigade was made, then they'll gradually make their way to the front and they'll build up their size. That's how most of my brigades and battalions now that were started out at less than full size, they're now full size. You know, infantry is 3,000, cavalry is about 2,500 because over time those those folks do, do file in. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how long it takes. It seemed to take somewhere around six to nine months, but it's also going to depend on battle, uh, you know, how many casualties they take and other factors, right? how many volunteers you have. So that'll be affected by recruitment subsidies and other policies. So as I said in other places, uh, one of the things you got to keep in mind about this game is that almost everything is affected by many other things and usually affects many other things its, itself. Uh, <clears throat> another reason why I would recommend that you uh, keep things relatively small at the outset, besides spiking demand and therefore prices before your economy is able to provide greater supply, is that according to the manual, smaller forces are easier to supply and their supply state affects their performance in battle and in campaigns. Again, tactically, we'll talk about why you need to be at your best, but you do need to be at your best. Uh, and one of the ways you make sure you do that is by making sure you are supplied. Right, related to the supply problem, uh, transport capacity is also limited at one time, and it's usually going to be at your lowest in the beginning of the war. As whatever size your core is, it all moves together. It's not like you can, well, it's you don't really detach brigades and battalions or, or anything like that. So if you have super large behemoth armies, you know, with six full infantry brigades, complemented with, I don't know, maybe an another six horse artillery or full artillery, whatever. If you're bringing like 25,000 men in one core down most of these railroads very early, you're, you're going to overwhelm the, the, the system and it's going to end up costing you more, I believe, 
That's my understanding is when you exceed rail, whatever the transport capacity is, uh, it incurs greater cost. And again, I'm trying to give you advice to have a, a capable army, but not one that breaks the bank in the first six to nine months to allow you some time to build up your economy to support a more capable military. Additionally, the reason why I would recommend recruiting this way is that smaller armies will recover readiness more quickly, all things being equal. <clears throat> like supply, the supply situation, as I understand the manual, higher readiness gives you advantages at both the strategic level and also in battle at the, the tactical level. Here's another kind of in general, as I understand it, your volunteer pool is going to be fixed at any one point in time. But I would say generally the volunteer pool will increase, particularly if you research the policies and provide the subsidies for it. At least as many as you can get, you will get. The manual says that maximum subsidies will double the number of volunteers after two years. And remember, as those new volunteers come up from each state, they will in the background join your understrength infantry and cavalry brigades. Again, I'm recommending you just take horse artillery and that you do those full. But if you take you know, some casualties, they'll also get, get rebuilt. But it doesn't take much to get the horse already back up to full strength. My view is, and it, and it is largely just my view, that this kind of gradual buildup of forces, which might take you know, six to nine months from the time you recruit a brigade till it reaches just about its peak, uh, it, it'll be less of a shock to your economy when it is least well prepared for it at the start of the war. Without, <laughs> without getting into tactics, I'll also say that having more small infantry brigades allows you more skirmishers for the number of men you're putting on the battlefield. And, you know, if you haven't heard before, I, I generally support the use of skirmishers. I think particularly early in a campaign when you don't want any of your brigades to take a lot of losses rapidly, when they don't have as much training and experience as you would like, that might make them better able to absorb the shock of, say, massive casualties. Uh, you'd probably want to have more skirmishers out because they tend to slow down the, the pace of the fighting and all things, well, if you use them correctly, generally, they're going to uh, deal more casualties than, than they take. Just as an example, uh, going back to the kind of under versus over strength, if you had 12,000 volunteers you could recruit from a state, you could choose to recruit four full strength brigades. Probably within a month, all 3,000 are going to be there, and boom those four full-strength brigades are going to be able to produce 200 skirmishers each. So you get a total of 800 skirmishers out of those 12,000 volunteers. If you go with my recommendation and you make each brigade 1,500 volunteers, you could get eight brigades. That's if you wanted to use up all your volunteers. That would give you 1,600 skirmishers. Right? Which, and I know the math here is not incredible, but you're going to get twice the number of skirmishers because you're going to choose these under strength brigades, <coughs> it's not going to, you're not going to lose the ability to produce skirmishers uh, in these units. I, th I don't know exactly what the cutoff is. I think it's around six or 700 men. Maybe it's less than a thousand. At some point, the brigade will get so small, it won't produce them. But at 1500, you're going to get the same 200 skirmishers per brigade as a larger brigade. Unless and until the devs change the amount of skirmishers that are kicked out by a particular brigade, this seems like one of the more clear-cut reasons why, why you do it. A relatively larger chunk of your force gets to fight as skirmishers, which generally means a positive casualty ratio with the enemy, and it likely protects you against rapid losses and, and routing that might result uh, from that. You don't have to necessarily use up all your your volunteers either, which is kind of the, the point I was making, uh, because if you maxed out the number of volunteers that you recruited in the above or the previous example, uh, then you'd kind of 
be putting the same effect on the economy that I'm trying to get you to avoid, which is don't buy a lot of stuff when you don't have a, a lot of it in, in supply. So you could recruit few, you know, fewer brigades than the maximum. Right? You could end up, rather than producing all eight, you could produce six, which would still be fewer men initially recruited, but you'd actually still have a skirmisher advantage. Or if you're mostly just interested in the skirmisher advantage, you could just recruit the same number of brigades, uh, I guess, which is what? Four? And you could just go skirmisher group v skirmisher group, and then you benefit more from saving money early on by not building up your forces. Having smaller units should also give you a comparable number of brigades compared to the AI. Okay. If, if the AI, and I think the AI is usually always recruiting full strength brigades. So with their 12,000 men, they would get their four full strength ones. If you only want to use, you know, six or eight thousand of that twelve thousand volunteer pool to keep your initial costs down, you're just going to have slightly smaller, smaller brigades. As long as they're fairly close to one another, the fact that each brigade the enemy has is larger should not be as much of a problem. You'll still be able to secure your flanks. Uh, you're going to have to maybe leave a bit more spacing in between them, uh, but as you get more comfortable with the controls of the, the, the brigades and so on, it, it shouldn't be a problem. It's actually still possible to, to go ahead and grab a flank on the AI, even if brigade br brigade for brigade you are smaller and you don't have a brigade advantage, you could still do it with uh, proper movement. I did not necessarily do it in this campaign, because again, I did this campaign for other reasons, but it kind of comes through here. My rule of thumb is that I get one horse artillery battalion for every infantry brigade I have and at least one cavalry unit per corps. That's going to be important to get at least that one cav unit in each of your corps because on the kind of strategic, the campaign map, it enables all the army abilities uh, such as scouting, raiding, and protecting the supply trains. And I'm gathering that the more cav you have, the better you do. Because I notice when I only have one cav brigade in a core and I set it to scout, my intelligence increases, but it usually goes from like blind to poor or something else like that. I haven't checked again since I added a second cavalry brigade, but that would seem to make sense because those cav units were pretty experienced and the quality of the intelligence didn't, didn't increase. So I'm thinking over the long term, adding a second, I don't know, per, I don't know about a third cavalry brigade in a division, but it, it should enhance the quality of those campaign level abilities your armies have. Uh, I even sometimes exceed my horse artillery per infantry brigade uh, ratio of kind of one to one. And, and I'll, I'll include more horse artillery than that. Uh, because I'm trying to use firepower and artillery to compensate for my lower overall numbers. Uh, I'll also use mobility and, and, and other things, but uh, for me, artillery and horse artillery in particular might allow me to compensate in part for not having as many souls on the battlefield. Uh, when they become available, if I can make it work economically, I'll look to rifled guns and cannons and also even small arms that give me a range advantage and pair well with the uh, mobility stuff I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. If you can win the range contest, if you can win the mobility contest, or if the AI never even challenges you for mobility, eventually you walk the AI into a couple of bad choices. And that's what you're trying to do when you get into the tactical level stuff. Either the AI, because it's outranged and outmoved, it has to retreat. Uh, it's going to have to castle up in its fortifications, uh, in which case we have a tactic for, for that. Or they're just going to have to say, forget about it, and they're going to have to come straight for you. At which case, or at which time, uh, you should be well prepared for them. And there's, there's quite a bit you can do if they can't really get at you at range, if they can't really harass your movement, if they got to just come straight to you. Uh, you, you should be in a pretty good position. 
Uh, while we're here, let's see. We'll go to... No, 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 no. We don't want that. Uh, maybe this. Let's talk about weapons upgrades pretty pretty quickly, I, I hope. Uh, depending on the policies that you have research, I would say try to upgrade the quality of your horse artillery first. I know I'm on infantry, but whatever. Uh, and again, you're looking for the rifled guns, the ones with range and accuracy. So your three inch ordnance, your 10 pound parrots, both of those are, uh, I believe the 14 pound James, all three of those uh, are good. I, I prefer the three inch and the 10 pound parrot, uh, but they are compatible with horse artillery. And they're relatively few you need to buy because the horse artillery battalions can't be that large anyways. Uh, as you'll see, admit, as you'll see, Artie is cheap to upgrade. And so getting the range advantage, uh, plus the fact that hopefully you've followed my advice and you've built up your horse artillery, uh, means that you also have a mobility advantage in addition to whatever cavalry you've created. Uh, for a little bit of a compare and contrast, just if you were thinking about, well, how do I spend limited funds to upgrade things? And I know that this is January of 63 in a spring 1861 campaign, but just, just bear with me here. So we have uh, Stevenson's, and I think that this whole army is pretty new. So if you notice that the total number of men is not 3,000, I believe that this this whole uh, core here is pretty new. But if you look at, yeah, they are new because I haven't even taken the, the basic upgrades for their, for their guns. Say I wanted the Mississippi, which I, I like. I mean, 500 yards, yes, please. Accuracy, very good. Fantastic. Reload rate is average for infantry weapons. Take a look at the cost. 412,000. Remember how much it costs to recruit an entire brigade. A full-strength brigade was about 537. So we're just saying we're not going to add any men to the battlefield, and we're just going to give the existing ones Mississippi rifles. That's that's an investment. It's not necessarily a bad one for reasons I'll talk about later. But right, these guys already have a three-inch ordnance rifle, so <clears throat> I'm not gonna I'm not looking to upgrade them at the moment. But compare that to the upgrade costs of other guns, right? To get this group, which what has seven guns, I think that's about the max that horse already can get. It's gonna cost me twenty-four thousand to get what, what I'd say is probably some of the best horse artillery out there. 24,000, that compared to 400 and something thousand, what was it for the, the Mississippi? And I mean, if you're worried that I'm, I'm like selecting an easy case, look, the Lorenz at 412, the Enfield at 412. Actually, I'm looking at this and I'm like, why wouldn't you take the Mississippi? Well, anyway, the, that's, that's something entirely different. Notice what you get later in the, the game. The cab weapon becomes an infantry weapon, but... Uh, that's quite what we would say maybe is an opportunity cost. I'm, I'm not. I haven't sat down and done the math, but about twenty-five thousand. So we could get four horse artillery battalions fully upgraded with long-range guns for a hundred thousand. So that's almost a sixteen-to-one trade-off. You could get one, not even full-strength infantry brigade, better rifles. Or you could get 16 artillery battalions. Again, this is a campaign in progress. Things have gone on. Subsidies have gone on. But I'm trying to get you to think about, you know, what would really do you better? One infantry brigade getting a bit more range, a bit more accuracy, or getting all your horse artillery, better range, better accuracy, and it's saving you a ton of money. I think the, the question kind of tells you where, where I think the, the value is. Okay, while we're on the topic of upgraded weapons, and I'll just we'll just bring it up to look at it. All right, the Mississippi. Uh, I, I compared it earlier to well, you could get an entire brigade, almost an entire brigade, and certainly a half strength brigade for as much as it would cost to just give better guns to to an existing one. Uh, that's true, right? We can't argue with the math, but in another sense, it's, it's not exactly true because we have to remember the compounding costs of army upkeep. Right? 
if you were to take that 400,000 and use it to raise a number of volunteers who are similarly equipped with just the, the mixed muskets, you now have to pay annually the cost to upkeep or keep up that unit. Uh, whereas if you're giving new arms to an existing brigade, which probably has quite a bit of training, it may have quite a bit of experience, uh, that is a more capable unit off the bat. And now you're giving them a better weapon. And I don't know if there are weapon upkeep costs that are factored into army upkeep, but my guess is that the recurring upkeep cost of upgrading weapons is much lower than the recurring upkeep cost of having more troops who you have to provision all the time. So it may not actually be cheaper in the, the long run to make some of those recruiting things I was thinking about. But uh, you'll be able to get access to most of these upgraded infantry and artillery weapons once you've done Diplomacy 1, Industry 1, and, and Industry 2. All right, one of the possible downsides of going small, it, it, it's possible, but I, I don't really think it is, uh, which is that if you have many infantry brigades that are relatively small, it's going to be hard to come up with the engineering points early on to protect them all with a lot of level 2 parapets. I mean, level 2 parapets, I think, are kind of the sweet spot of cover for cost. Uh, but, <coughs> excuse me, again, there's not a lot of engineering points usually lying around from your core to, to build enough to, to get them all in because you have several, although they're smaller on average than your enemy's brigade. Uh, we talk about the overloaded flank tactic in a different video. This problem is removed. Uh, as long as the parapets are in the kind of anchor part of your line that is there to make sure that the overloaded flank itself doesn't get hit in the, the flank, you're only going to need a small percentage of your brigades sitting in those hopefully level two uh, parapets and the rest of your force will be concentrating elsewhere. So it is one of those things that, you know, if you think about it, yeah, it, it, it could be a problem, particularly early on, uh, but I don't think that it is. All right, folks, that was the last part of what I wanted to do in this this video of how to get you to think about building that building your forces out but starting small and then over time allowing new recruits to come in get them uniformed get them equipped uh, and get them into the the field but again the game incentivizes you to have and, and maintain relatively small forces uh, numbers do help I would say this is completely anecdotal and it, it'll change based on other things that you've subsidized and policies and, and, and what the armies are doing. But it seems to me that core of 15,000 or less have far fewer supply problems than my core when they reach 20 or 25,000. And so you can you decide where you want the end numbers to be. Of course, you can always switch units in and out and create additional armies and, and other things in the OOB, the order of battle stuff that's in the game. Uh, but I, I, I would say that if you're going to buy into this kind of small core structure, I, I would say your upper end limit is, is probably going to be about 15,000. And the key is going to be to keep those core close enough to one another to be scouting to see what trouble might be coming your way, or better yet, attack, so you know where you need to concentrate several core so that they can cooperate together. Uh, that's what I've, I've argued you, you should do. And while you're going through the policies I suggested, hopefully you've also maxed out the subsidies as I've suggested. What should happen is that your economy should develop the capacity to support the forces that you are, are fielding. It can get large. 
uh, I, I know that in the campaign that you saw a little bit of in this video, uh, when I stopped recruiting new brigades initially in the, I think it was the summer of 61, I had about 60,000 troops. And it wasn't until that winter that they pretty much all reached full strength. And then I had about 115 or 120,000. And at that point, uh, the AI's numbers were going down. So I actually ended up with more troops than them. And so I kind of started out small and I did okay, but then I just let myself get big and it caused some economic issues. But I'll leave those for a, a different video. As always, this video, the videos I put out, it, it's a work in progress. If I got something wrong, if you got something else, something better, just something different, throw it down in the comments so that players who find this in the future can stay updated. Because again, this is version 1.0. Who knows what's going to happen? And this may all be wrong. Uh, but the point of this video and the others that I've put out and hopefully will put out is meant to be informational for new players. So I'd ask that let's try to help them out. Let's try to keep them and ourselves updated and give them the kind of state of our knowledge about how this this game works as i mentioned so many times here this video is not everything you need to know about my kind of going small or going medium approach because you probably are going to be outnumbered particularly in 1861 and as i've also allowed to happen in this campaign that's now going into 63 uh, you are going to be outnumbered on some battles uh, I, I would say that it, it's not it's not certain, but I don't pay attention to everything. And so, you know, mistakes happen and you get outnumbered. So in future videos, we'll talk about some of the tactics you can do while you're outnumbered. Sometimes what you can do to stall the AI uh, while you're waiting for reinforcements to arrive, because I did go with military two. And so uh, we were working through the uh, grand army structure at, at, at that point. Uh, but this campaign... I did practice what I preach in terms of the going small. I just didn't do it optimally. And so far, it's been been fairly fairly viable. All right. I hope this helped, particularly if you're struggling uh, to get through the, the Spring 61. Uh, and uh, we'll fill in some of the tactical gaps in the future. All right, folks. Until then, take care.